Hey everybody, Riley Holland here, and I'm here once again with friend and colleague Robert Grossman, the wellness business systematologist. How are you doing, Robert? Doing fine, Riley. How are you doing? Doing great. So I'm excited to talk with you as always, but especially because we had a little bit of a cliffhanger last time talking about part one of systematization. And as anyone can tell from looking at the name of your business, Wellness Prosperity Systems, or looking at your own title, the Wellness Business Systematologist, we can see that this idea of systematization, building systems, and optimizing systems in your business is very central to what you do. And I know that too, just for being a personal coaching client of yours. It's all about building systems. So last time we kind of... We just riffed on the topic a little bit. We meandered. We talked about just why systematization is so important and how we can do it with this sort of new paradigm of business attitude that you've talked about in detail in other interviews as well, as opposed to the old, moldy, dysfunctional, corporate version where systems were built so long ago and then just calcified and they kind of give systems a bad name. And we also talked about how really every element of business can be rethought, redesigned so that better first principles, right? These new paradigm first principles can be represented in every aspect and then energy can flow through the business without those obstructions. We talked about how doing that really frees up energy for the business owner so that there's more flow in general going through the business and less having to force things to happen. We talked about how having systems gives you more control of the business and it allows you to be more of an extension of just who you are, your own personality, your own self-expression, your own individuality as it relates to the impact that you want to have on the world. And to me, that makes all the difference. And that part almost seems counterintuitive, talking about systems. So that's pretty essential. So we talked about all these things, and we ended with a promise to return and talk more about specific things that we can do, specific action steps to implement these ideas of systematization and actually get to feel and see the benefits of it in your own business. So, Robert, how does the process of systematization actually look? Like for somebody, if they're already hooked, if they're already salivating, like I imagine many are, if they wanted to get started with this right away, what would they actually do? Well, first of all, thank you for that great summary of what we talked about. I'm really excited about this conversation because this is where the rubber really hits the road as far as the actions. We're going to talk about what you can actually do, actions to take. That's what I'm all about, and I hope that's what people listening to this are all about, and that they take this and use it to do better whatever they do. But I do think we did it the right way, because last time we talked about the philosophy and the mindset and the attitude, and like you said, some parts of it are counterintuitive. I remember I was amazed when I began to realize that actually building systems increases your ability for self-expression through the business. So this is going to be interesting talking now about how that translates into action. So that said, there are many different ways to do it, but the way I approach systematization, there are basically six steps. The first step is actually kind of a preparation, and I just call it clean out the clutter. The idea being that most businesses have got a lot of processes, a lot of assets, a lot of junk inside, stuff that was done at a certain time for a certain reason, but it's not needed anymore. You clear that out and it frees up energy, which can be used for systematization because it does take some energy and effort to do it. The second process is blueprinting. And blueprinting is basically when you look at the business as a whole, and you just break it down into the different activities, the different areas of action that are going on. I'll talk more about exactly how that looks in a few minutes. The third step is understanding the critical factors for each process of the business. So the idea here is you're figuring out what are the actual key factors that determine how well you're delivering value to your clients through that particular process, whether it's lead generation, whether it's 
vision or customer service or actually delivering the service or product. There are critical factors in every process and when you understand what those are, now you can focus in a defined area for a defined result. Fourth step is actually building the systems, which is creating clear processes that gives you the opportunity to optimize, to automate, and basically to focus your energy on the genius tasks which only you can do and allow a lot of the routine and the supporting functions of the business to begin to work in a way that can be optimized, can be delegated, or at least just put on rails so they're smooth and no longer distractions. Number five is creating a performance dashboards. This is something we do a lot in the big corporate world. It's very rarely done in small medium business, but it's extremely useful and it's very easy to do. Just like when you drive your car, you have your speedometer and maybe you have the thing that shows how fast the engine is spinning, you have your gas gauge, all the key information is right there in front of your eyes and that's what allows you to be confident that your car is operating within the proper parameters. So you can create that for your business too. It's very easy to do and it's a vital management tool. Having that is like the equivalent of opening up your eyes and suddenly you have a lot of clarity and much more confidence in your business. That's part of what makes it more easeful to run the business when you can relax because you know that things are operating the way they should. And then finally, optimizing. And that's what we've talked about many times. Once you've defined the processes that go into the business, now you can begin this process that we always talk about of innovating, of looking out into the world, into other industries for new ideas and testing them out in a small way and then incrementally improving what you do. And this is how you use systematization as a foundation to create exponential growth through the process of optimizing each of the different key processes of the business. Well, I love how you break it down like this because, again, for me as someone who's kind of new to business in general, you know, I hear something like, systematization, oh, lots of syllables in that word, oh, this is going to be complicated. But then here, just in those six steps, it feels like a very natural, simple, almost common sense. And I know we're going to be applying it to things that are very complex or can be complex, and it's going to help simplify those. But the process itself just seems so intuitive, like, oh, I, I understand this. It reminds me of last night I cleaned out my bedroom closet and rearranged it and I, and I almost feel like I can see this just the very basic building blocks of this process at work even in a simple task like that so it seems like this is something that people can feel comfortable with it is completely common sense a lot of people get intimidated this idea of systematizing the business it sounds kind of esoteric but it is absolutely common sense and you know there's a simple approach to dealing with complexity. In college I studied physics, engineering physics, and there's very complex systems and theoretical structures that you're working with and there's an approach to dealing with complexity there. And then as a business consultant dealing with business systems, exact same approach works to deal with complexity. And it's just this, you break it down into little pieces. And that's exactly how this process of systematization works. That's why I broke it down into these six steps because that's the way I think about it and that's the way I do it to make it simple for myself and within each of those six steps also you just need to look at one bit of the business at a time it becomes very simple and common sense of course if you think about the whole business a business is complex but actually if you just pick one area of the business and focus on it and apply what we're going to talk about here it's systematizing one single aspect of the business if you choose a high leverage aspect of the business like something in your sales or marketing area i would recommend to begin with or any aspect which is a trouble area you can create tremendous benefits just by focusing on one single area and then later maybe you have time three months later six months later a year later you do one more area you don't need to do the whole thing okay so if, for example when we're starting out with step one clean out the clutter we're not cleaning out the clutter of the entire business necessarily, we can go through this entire six-step process even on little micro levels. Absolutely you can. It's going to depend on 
the individual situation. It's going to depend on how much time and energy you have to put into it and where you have problems and where things are already running smoothly. So you have to use common sense with this process. It may not always make sense to do 100% everywhere. It makes sense, and once again, a sense of relief washes over me because that makes it manageable. Like, you know, cleaning my closet and not feeling like I have to clean the whole house. Right. Although, in particular with this step, with the first step on cleaning the clutter, I do think there is a certain magic in doing a 100% job. And out of the six steps, that's the only one where I'm going to say that. But there's a certain liberation that you get when you've looked over all the aspects of your business or of your life or your house and cleaned out the clutter. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at that one. What would that look like, cleaning out the clutter, if you decide you want to make a clean sweep of your business? Cleaning out the clutter is just basically based on the insight that we have this clutter that collects in our life. It's old stuff, and some of it is physical stuff like files and equipment that we no longer use. Some of it is intangible stuff like data or processes which are no longer relevant. And we don't necessarily realize it. We're not using it, so we may not be even aware of it consciously. But subconsciously, we are aware of it, and it drains our energy. This is the kind of thing where most people don't even realize how much of a burden that clutter is until you start cleaning it and start to feel yourself more light. You feel like a weight is off your shoulders, literally. For me, actually, this is a never-ending process. It's something I revisit every couple of months. I normally spend a day or two every couple of months just cleaning out my clutter in my business and my life because, you know, maybe it has to do with my personality style, but I do tend to collect clutter and it burdens me down. And I just notice, I realize that I'm not operating as efficiently as I want to. I feel like I'm slogged down a little bit. I normally take one or two days and just dedicate to clean out the clutter. I put everything else aside. And after that, it's like I have a lot of fresh energy. Well, that makes sense in terms of thinking about this whole six-step process as a cycle. Because I know for me, in terms of optimizing things, getting better at things, it's easy to forget once you have a new way of doing things that's more effective. You also have to make sure that you clear out the old way and make sure that it's gone and not weighing it down anymore. Yeah, exactly. And you know, sometimes we don't even realize how many different kinds of clutter we have and how much that we have. I think it's useful to do a scan. And when you do a scan, keep in mind there's basically two types of clutter. There's the tangible, the physical clutter, and then there's the intangibles. So physical clutter is like the stuff you have in your closets, on shelves, in desk drawers, filed away in file cabinets, folders, on bookshelves. It's sitting in your collections of three-ring binders. Some people have stacks of old stationery. And, you know, you tell yourself, oh, I'm going to use that someday, but you're never going to use that. I know a guy who has boxes of five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and he won't <laughs> throw it away because the data on that was vital to his business 18 years ago. <laughs> I know another guy who has like six old computers stacked up in his garage, a stack of computers, but you can't use an old computer. It's just taking up space and it's taking up mind space as well. Yeah, I come across that too. People have a hard time sometimes getting rid of things or even thinking to get rid of things. Right. But actually that side of it, the physical clutter side is the easier side. There's the intangible clutter also, which you get in a business. And that can be more tricky because it's sometimes harder to be aware of it. So I'm talking about things like business processes that don't make sense anymore, routines that you have. Maybe it's technology systems that you have which are no longer useful. Reporting is a big one. I worked once for a bank in Europe where they had a department of 90 people creating management reports, and they had over 150 different reports that they created and sent out to the different de departments of the bank. And we actually called up the heads of all the departments, and we asked them how many of those reports they read, and it turned out that out of all those 150 reports, there were only four that anybody actually used. Wow. Yeah, that's a it was, lot of wasted hours. <laughs> it was a lot of wasted hours. So that's a big one. 
a lot of times products and services are clutter because if you have a lot of different products and services in your business, there probably are a few that don't make money for you and don't add value to the clients. It's at least worth taking a look at. Wow, definitely, yeah. Okay, so let's say that a person has gone through that. They've rented the dumpster for the weekend or whatever it takes. They've maybe recognized some big waste vortexes that they can get rid of. They've cleaned the clutter. They're feeling relieved. And then we move on to blueprinting. So what would that look like once this free space, some energy is opened up? What is blueprinting? Blueprinting is the way that you get a handle on everything that's going on inside the business. So like we said, when you systematize, you don't have to do the whole thing, but you need to have a way to divide up the business, to put it into categories. Processes exist in the business, but until you conceptualize those processes, until you name them and define the boundaries of them, it's hard to manage them. So blueprinting is basically listing out all the different processes that you have in the business. And it's easier than it sounds because if you look at it in the most simple form, every business has four basic categories of activity. So you have leadership, which is everything relating to the strategy, the overall goals and vision and objective setting in the business, as well as motivating the employees and the people who work in the business. Number two, you have what I call business development. This is basically sales and marketing. It's the process of bringing new people into the business or of selling some product or service to the people who already have a relationship with you. Number three is what I call fulfillment. In a product business, this is actually the manufacturing and shipping of the physical product. In a service business, this is actually delivering the service to the clients. Basically, that's everything that the client is actually paying for, fulfillment. And then finally, you have administration, where you have all the supporting functions. You have to pay taxes. You have to do the accounting. You have to maintain the facilities. And there's a whole list of things in administration. That's the list I start with. And when you have that, you basically go through the list and you think through all the key processes in your business, everything that has to happen in those areas. Well, it makes total sense why you'd want to do that after cleaning out the clutter, right? You don't want to be organizing things that don't need to be there. You just recently guided me through this process or the beginning of it on a recent coaching call. And I can say it was enormously clarifying just to be able to see all the different areas in a pretty short list. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's all there. I don't need to work on all of it at once. I can't work on all of it at once. But I see where all the little pieces are that fit together to make the puzzle. Yes, it is enormously clarifying. That's the whole purpose of blueprinting. And the other purpose of blueprinting is it allows you to prioritize. Because when you see that whole list, you may realize that marketing is much more important to your overall fulfillment of your vision and mission, the reason your business exists, than, say, accounting. And it allows you to consciously make the choice that I'm going to work on improving my marketing system and accounting can wait a little bit. You can only make those choices consciously once you actually have seen it, though. Oh, okay, so is that getting into step three, the understanding critical factors? It is, but I just want to make one more little comment on the blueprinting step because this is a key aspect that people are going to need in order to do it. First of all, this is not really a long process. This is like two, three, four hours of sitting down, thinking, and writing out a list. Number two, there's a certain way that's very helpful. And the way I like to do it is I think about it in terms of multiple levels of detail. So the top level of detail is those four areas that I mentioned. It's your leadership, business development, fulfillment, and administration. Within each of those four areas, you have certain functions. So for example, business development has two functions in it. It's marketing and sales. And within those functions, you have sub-functions. So for example, within marketing, one sub-function might be lead generation. Another one might be market research. 
when you look inside those, you find the fourth and final level of detail, which is the actual task. So for example, in your lead generation, you might have radio advertising. You might have your yellow page ad. You might have some Google pay-per-click advertising. It's basically an outline or a mind map or a hierarchy. And what I recommend that you do is think through each level of detail, one after the other. So you start with the top level. That's a freebie because you have the four areas. Then for each of those four areas, just list the high-level functions, the main functions inside it. So in your leadership, you have vision and mission, company-level goals, business strategy, motivation, and maybe assessing the performance of the business. That's it. You're done at that level of detail. And you go through all four main areas at that high level of detail. That's pretty easy because you're thinking in big blocks. Then you go through that list and you add the third level of detail, these sub-functions. And finally, when you have that, you go through and you just ask yourself the very practical, grounded, down-to-earth question, what are the actual tasks that we perform every day to get this function done? And this gives you the final level of detail for your list. Most people can finish that in four hours at most. And it is tremendously clarifying. Even if you just go that far in the systematization process and then stop and never do anything else, a lot of people tell me that they get tremendous benefit just from doing the blueprinting. And I know I do. That's one of the first things I do when I work with a new client or a new industry is just to clarify for myself so that I can speak with confidence about that particular business. I'll sit down and I'll do a blueprint of it just for my own use to clarify my thoughts so that when I speak to my client, I'm not confused anymore. Yeah, it sounds like you get the bird's eye view, but all the way down to the practical level too. So it has immediate practical usefulness. So how do we get from blueprinting to this step three, understanding critical factors? Well, understanding critical factors, this is where a lot of light bulbs go on because when you understand your critical factors, then you can identify which processes are most crucial for your success. And that allows you to focus your attention on those and take care of them before everything else. This is actually the whole basis for systematizing anything. Like you said, it's a common sense exercise, but it's something people don't usually think through in a clear, structured way. So what I recommend is to go through that blueprinting list, not at the deepest level of detail, but at the middle levels of detail, where you're seeing functional chunks of the business. And for each one, just ask the simple question, what determines whether this succeeds or fails? I'll give you a hint because there are typical areas where you see critical factors in most businesses. So for example, the way that you choose your market, the way that you segment your target market is almost a critical factor for everybody. The way that you actually deliver your service, the way you fabricate your product if you have a product, or the way that you actually create and describe your service is a critical factor for almost everybody. The way you source your inputs to your process. So, you know, for a massage therapist, that might be the, the types of creams and lotions and oils that you're using. It's the raw materials, the quality of those and where you get them. The way that you qualify prospects and find new leads is a critical factor for almost everybody, right? And the way that you sell or the way that you manage your resellers, if you have those, that's normally a critical factor. The way that you set your prices, the way you structure guarantees, the way you hire people and train them, the way you manage them and motivate them. And the last one that I always think about, this gets overlooked a lot, but it is a critical factor. How do you handle customer complaints? These are just examples, but I hope they help to just make it clear what I'm talking about. These are all things that affect the client's received value because you have to be for your client. You have to love your client and you have to put service to your client in front of everything else. So the way you handle your accounting or the way you deal with your taxes, your client never sees that. And that is not going to make the critical factors list. It doesn't make or break your business. But basically everything you do that touches your client directly probably is a pretty good candidate for a critical factor. Okay, so we're looking at that blueprint, that bird's eye view, and deciding what are the most important things that I can spend my time on in terms of building systems to get the, the most bang for my buck. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Because 
almost every business has a few critical factors that they do not do well. You have a company that delivers a terrific product, but they're terrible at distribution. Or you have some sort of a therapist or a healer who's amazingly talented, but terrible at marketing. All the time you have this, and almost every business has it. So when you simply list this out and take a look at it, the next question you ask is, well, how good am I at this? And most business owners will see right away that there's two or three items on that list that they just leap off the page because they're obviously vitally important to the business, and you know very well that it's not really your strong point. Now, that's the area where you have what we call low-hanging fruit. It's very easy by making some easy changes in an area like that to make a dramatic improvement in your business. Well, that's really clarifying too, because we started out kind of saying, well, you don't have to do this with your entire business at once, but suddenly like the process itself helps you see exactly what those areas are that you can focus on and get the most out of. So then we get to the actual step four, building the system. So you've seen the whole plan, you've chosen the critical factors, and now you're building system. So what might that look like for any one of these given critical factors? First of all, let's talk about what's the purpose here of building a system because a lot of people don't get it at first when I talk about the idea of structuring your organization around well-designed systems. But this is important for a few different reasons. First of all, it allows you to create a business that's not dependent on one or two star players or just one person. Normally, that's the business owner herself who the businesses depend on. It lets you create a business that can function without you always being there. It also makes you a lot more efficient and profitable. And most of all, it lets you grow because only when you have a system, you can improve it. So that's what we're going for. So let me also talk about what is a system because once you understand what a system is, actually creating it, is simple and common sense. So a system is basically a set of processes. Maybe it's just one process that's documented. It's just simply written down, step one, step two, step three. You have descriptions of the steps that are needed. Maybe it's flowcharts or just text. And a set of tools to create the system. Yeah, it makes this a permanent structure that can then be monitored and improved. So let's talk about monitoring and improving. Before we go there, I just want to make sure that people get at least the minimum what they need to actually take action on this. And I feel like there's just one more point that's essential because I didn't talk about actually how you build the system. I just wanted to point out that the easiest way to create a system is to take an existing process and write it down step by step. So that's what you do. And let me just give a quick example to dimensionalize that and demonstrate why it's worth doing. Because a lot of people give me a blank look. Why in the world would I bother writing down something that's already happening? But for example, one of the critical processes in most businesses is what happens when the telephone rings. Because the next couple of minutes is going to determine whether that person who called becomes a client or goes on to dial one of your competitors. Okay, and I'm simplifying, but I think you understand the case I'm talking about. So the simple act of taking a careful look at that and writing down step by step what happens, who answers the phone, how is it answered, how fast is it answered, what is said in different scenarios. One of the easiest ways to create a dramatic increase in sales for most businesses is to actually write down the script of what the person who answers the phone says to the prospect who's on the line. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And this might sound kind of silly, but it reminds me of a documentary I saw recently on stand-up comedians dealing with hecklers. Because that talk about critical factors. If you're a comedian, you're in charge of the entire room and the whole thing could get thrown off by a heckler. So they were saying the best comedians have a whole kind of script or series of jokes that they can go to to deal with hecklers. Of course, it still has to be organic but they're prepared and they've tried those things out. They know how to deal with it. So thinking of it in terms of answering the phone, I mean, that might strike someone immediately as that's a little odd, a script. But when you put it like that, it makes total sense, especially in terms of it being such a critical factor. 
Absolutely. You might call it talking points instead of a script or something that gives a little bit more of a feeling of flexibility and spontaneity, but absolutely that's obvious that that's vital what is said during that conversation. It's too important to leave it to chance. Great. Oh, and I have to say, this six-step process is an example of that. Yes, it is. So everyone, you're seeing this at work even as we speak. So we're getting a little bit low on time here. We've got two more steps to talk about. Let's talk about creating performance dashboards. You've got the system. Now what do we do with it? Okay, well, the performance dashboard, as I said, is like the dashboard of your car. And really, this is one of the first things that I do with every client is set up a performance dashboard. It not only helps them tremendously because they can see how well they're doing, it also helps me and my relationship with the client because we can objectively measure how much value is being created by each little change that we implement. So very, very quickly, the performance dashboard is simply a set of measures or metrics that tell you how things are doing. So it begins with your critical factors. You have a list of critical factors already. And for each of those, you can define metrics for each factor and create a process to measure it. So for example, we talked about lead generation. The way that you do lead generation is a critical process and a critical factor for basically every business. And you have certain metrics for lead generation. For example, the number of leads who come in per month and the cost per lead. Simple metrics, but until you know those numbers, you cannot manage your lead generation process. Once you have those numbers, it's a no-brainer and they're measured automatically and you can see them at a glance. Now you have a tremendous ability to manage that process. You can make tweaks and you can tell what impact it's having. We've talked about exponential growth and exponential growth comes from tweaking the metrics in multiple areas of the business in such a way that they have this multiplicative effect. So when you're measuring your lead gen, you're also measuring your sales process. For example, what's the average transaction value with the client? What's the average number of months that a client stays with you? What's the frequency of purchase? These are metrics that have to do with sales. And you can see that these multiply with each other. So these multiply together. And that's the key to exponential growth is these multiplicative relationships between metrics. But you have to be able to measure the metrics first. Yes, and I love the thing about it as a dashboard because it's so vivid. Imagining trying to drive a car on the highway without a dashboard. I mean, think about what chaos that would be. Right, and I like the car dashboard as an example of it also because a car dashboard is really simple. I mean, there's really only a few dials on there. And for most small businesses, the performance dashboard for the business can also be very simple. In fact, you don't want to have 50 different metrics or 100 metrics because you can't understand it. You can't go over it. But when you have five numbers and you know these are the key numbers that tell you how well you're doing, and you may set it up for a particular project. You know, if you're developing a marketing system, you can choose the five metrics that have to do with marketing. If you're working on a product manufacturing, you'd have a different set of metrics. This isn't necessarily something you do once in a lifetime. It's something you do for a particular management purpose. Right. Okay. So once you got the metrics, in sight, then you can optimize. Right. Then you can optimize. In my philosophy of business, optimization is the whole purpose of creating systems. The whole idea, you know, when I have a great idea or an inspiration, I want to have a place where I can put it in my business where it's going to work and not just get lost. For example, somehow I always get ideas in the shower. I don't know why. It's the worst place, actually, to have an idea from the point of view of implementation because I can't write them down in the shower. I mean, all I have is a bar of soap. But what I do is I have a little voice recorder on my iPad, and as soon as I get out of the shower, I click it on, and I just dictate those ideas into the voice recorder. And those go onto my testing list. I believe in and I preach a philosophy of little tests, baby steps. Because when you have a new idea, you never really know. I mean, I don't think we have the ability or even the right to presume what is going to be good for our clients. But we need to try it out and see how people actually respond. So I think that optimization is this whole process of finding new ideas, new ways to do things, 
testing them out in a little way that's not high cost, that's low risk, low cost, easy and quick, measuring the result, and then if it's an improvement, well, once you've gotten this far in the systematization process, it's, it's easy to see that once you find an improved way, an improved set of talking points for the telephone, an improved headline for your Yellow Pages advertisement, whatever it is, you now have a place where you can implement that and make it a permanent feature of the business. So it almost sounds like with systems, we're making something so that we can make it better. Yeah, exactly. It's an iterative process. There's a one-time effort. I mean, most businesses do not have systems, at least small businesses usually do not. They might have for certain areas like accounting, but for the really important things, usually they don't. So there's a one-time effort to basically think it through. But after that, it's an incremental process of always revisiting and optimizing and tweaking it. And this is the path of exponential growth. This is the path that allows you to work less, put in less effort, have less stress, have a more useful life, but also have more impact, more joy, and more profit in your business. Beautiful. I think that's a wonderful thought to end on, too, especially because it brings this whole new paradigm or a big aspect of it into focus, which is no more Protestant work ethic, more is suffering is not always better, right? Exactly, exactly. That concept, which is so deeply ingrained in our subconscious for so many of us, that's such a destructive idea, isn't it? That the harder you work, the more you suffer, the better job you're doing. It's not like that at all. And especially in business culture, you know, Western business culture arose so, so directly out of that. But that's crumbling because it just doesn't work and it's crumbling on a large scale and maybe it had to, but no need to weep over it because, look, here's another way. And I hope those of you listening have been taking notes or are about to click replay and take notes because there was a hell of a lot in there that if you get these steps and you understand what's really going on here, it's going to make a huge difference, I can guarantee so, Robert, thank you again for clarifying these things, for breaking it down, and really showing not only why it's so important, but how to get started on it. And I know it was just the quick and dirty version, but again, iterations, right? You start out with the basic insights, then maybe we can come back through and talk about some of these steps in more detail sometime in the future. Absolutely. There's a lot that we didn't cover, but... When you understand the purpose of what you're doing and when you understand how these six steps fit together and what the outcome should be for your business, you can fill in a lot of the how-to just with common sense. So I hope that the process doesn't seem intimidating. It shouldn't be. It takes a little bit of time and energy, but it's easy and simple once you break the business down into chunks and look at one chunk at a time, and it's so rewarding. All right. Well, once again, thank you. And Robert, you have an amazing and productive and highly systematized day. <laughs> Thank you, Riley. You too.